Welcome, friends and family. We are so glad that you've taken some time to join us to pause and reflect and remember the events of Good Friday. All around the world right now, followers of Jesus are stopping to remember the events leading up to the cross and Jesus' death. These events remind us of the incredible cost that God paid for your salvation and way back to our loving God. These events also remind us of the immeasurable worth that every human being has because God was willing to pay the ultimate price for you and for me. So as we go through these elements, as we go through these stories and we remember and recount these details, I wanna encourage you to take them personally. These events were for you, they were for me. They were so that we can know God forever. And so we would like to invite you to make this time interactive. If you haven't already yet, uh, grab some candles. We are going to be using four candles. If you don't have candles, you can use tea lights. You can use some lamps in your house. They don't have to be incredibly fancy. Um, but we want to retell this story and we want to sit in these scriptures and reflect in a way that is meaningful. And we are praying that God uses this to deepen our devotion for him that God reminds us of the great cost that he paid for us and that our love and appreciation for Easter and the celebration that we come with the resurrection will come with that much more depth and meaning and richness uh, because we've sat in the truth and the reality of the cross. So if you haven't yet, uh, please set your candles out uh, like this in front of you. And I would encourage you as this goes along, if you've got little children with you, uh, to watch and to tell and explain to them uh, what these events mean. Remind them of the great cost that Jesus paid for you and for me. And let us treasure, let us treasure the amazing reality that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So as we go through our time together, we will be lighting these candles. Um, as we light them, I would encourage you and your family to light them every time you see one lit. Every time that we blow out a candle, we'd like to invite you in your home to turn off that light or blow out that candle. We're going to start our story where John starts his gospel in John chapter one. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to turn there with us. John chapter one reads, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him and apart from him, 
nothing was created that has been created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of men. Light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. In verse 10 we read, He was in the world, and though the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all those who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God to all those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. This is, this is our story. This is what we believe, and this is what we tell as Christians, that, that this world was created with intention, that this world was created by design, that it was crafted by the loving hands of a creator, our God. And we learn that in the beginning, Jesus was with God, that Jesus was God, and that Jesus was there from the beginning. And that Jesus, in our state, did not leave us stuck in our sin, but instead was willing to take on flesh and blood and become like you and me and walk the life that you and I could never walk. And John gets really poetic and he lets us know that even though the world was created for him and through him, it did not recognize him. But instead, the tragic happens that the creation rejects the creator once again. And we find out that the fall of man wasn't just something that happens with Adam and Eve, but it's something that all of us have done. We have taken God out of his rightful place in our lives. So in the beginning of John's gospel, we learn that light was with God since the beginning. And that light was the light of all creation. That Jesus made everything through him and for him. And then we learn that Jesus was the light of all men and that light bore flesh and blood and became incarnate. And lastly, we see that even though the darkness did not understand Jesus, it could not overcome the light. And so we begin our story with the light that was with God, the light of creation, the light that became flesh, and the light of hope that could not be extinguished. Let's celebrate that truth together. Jesus is the light of the world. And as that passage from John 1 said, uh, life was in him. He is the source of life. And that life was the light of men. He is the light of the world. And tonight, as we reflect on uh, the events, some of the events from Good Friday, um, although it is very sobering for sure, what um, we can take great hope because the light of the world gave himself up, went to such lengths as this to rescue and redeem us. And so tonight, we can have hope in him. And we want our remembering to be with hope. Um, so even at the start here, I want to invite you to put your hope in Jesus uh, as we go through tonight. And let's just pray this uh, prayer out loud together. Jesus, light of the world, lead us tonight and fill us with your spirit that we might know your presence with us as we remember your sacrifice. Thank you for loving us so relentlessly and giving so much to see us rescued and alive with you. Help us now to place our hope in you. Amen. There is a light, it burns brighter than the sun, he steals the night and casts no shadow, there is hope. Should oceans rise and mountains fall, he never fails. So take heart. 
Let his love lead us through the night And hold on to hope And take courage again And death by love the fallen world was overcome He wears the scars Of our freedom In His name All our fears are swept away He never fails No, He doesn't So take heart Let His love lead us through the night and hold on to hope and take courage again All our troubles, all our fears, God our hope, He has overcome all our failure, all our tears, God our love, He has overcome all our heartache. God, our healer, He has overcome all our burdens and all our shame. God, our freedom, He has overcome all our troubles and all our tears. God, our hope. God our grace, God our freedom, He has overcome, God our refuge, and God our strength, God is with us, He has overcome. He has overcome There is a light It burns brighter than the sun He steals the night Cast no shadow There is hope Should oceans rise and mountains fall He never fails he has overcome. John starts his recounting of Jesus' life by saying that God was before everything. He was in everything. He created all things, and then he becomes flesh and blood. He actually becomes like you and me. And when he showed up on the scene, we didn't recognize him. And for me, I kind of like to say that that's their story. And when I think of Adam and Eve and when I think of sin sometimes, I even think of that's their story, that's their problem, and I'm now living with their consequences. But if I dig a little bit deeper, I think the same situation falls on me. There are so many times that I try to fit God on my schedule. I fit God into my world and my parameters. And much of the calamity and sin that I brought on myself, I expect God to fix. But when I want God to fix it, I want him to fix it my way. 
I'm oftentimes caught up making God more in my image rather than me being in his image saying, God, I'm all yours. And when Jesus enters in the scene, uh, the people were expecting a savior. They were expecting someone to come and redeem all things. And it didn't look the way that they intended. It didn't look the way that they had hoped. It didn't fit their box of who God was or how God would operate. And so even though God who made all things was walking in the flesh in their midst, they didn't recognize him. And instead they rejected him. And that claim to be God is what brought Jesus to the cross. And on the cross, they mocked their creator. And if you could just take a minute and listen to these words, can you imagine being the creator of the world and listening to your own creation say these things back to you? All right, we're going to be reading from John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king! And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! But Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Psalms tells us that God knows how many hairs are on our head. He knows the words we're going to speak before we say them. He is intimately acquainted with you and me. He loves us dearly. And then can you imagine hearing his creation that he knows so well say and do these things when they rejected and they beat him and they mocked him. So as we come to extinguish the first candle, we remember that even though the world was created through him, it did not recognize him. Would you pray this with me? Jesus, we remember that you endured the mockery and the rejection of your creation. Let's extinguish the candle together. Isaiah 53, three through six. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, 
and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So John tells us in his gospel that the word became flesh. The light that gives light to all men had become flesh and blood for you and for me. Philippians says it this way, that even though he was fully God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he took on the nature of a servant. And then Jesus lived the life that you and I could never live. And then he endured a suffering that you and I could never endure. And so we remember on Good Friday that the flesh, the body, the real physical living Jesus suffered and endured hardship for you and for me. Isaiah says that he was despised and rejected by man, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. And yet he himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities, and the punishment of our peace was on him, and we were healed by his wounds. For us as followers of Jesus, it's easy, I think, to sometimes wonder where God is when life doesn't go the way that we expected. We've put our trust in Jesus. We've asked Jesus to do great things for us. And then in the middle of our lives, when things get tough and difficult, we start to fall back to blame. We start to fall back to discouragement. We start to fall back to doubt. And we start to wonder, God, where are you when my life doesn't go how I want it to go? And it's in hard times that we can remember that Jesus endured the hardest time for us. And that if we're ever enduring something hard and following God, he is never going to ask you to do something that he himself has not already. So for us on Good Friday, we remember that when we are led to hard places by following Jesus, Jesus is never going to invite you or me to do something that he didn't already endure himself. And Jesus endured things that we could never endure, which was the punishment that brings us peace. Jesus paid for our unrighteousness so that we could become righteous. I love the way it said in Colossians that God took him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might have the righteousness of God. And so we remember and think about the suffering that Jesus endured, the, the mocking, the beating, the pain, the agony of the cross, being thirsty, being tired, being naked and ashamed on a cross fully exposed for other people. And the worst of it wasn't even those things. It was what was to come next. But we remember that that suffering that Jesus went through was for our peace. So as we put the second candle out, let's pray this together out loud now. Jesus, we remember how you suffered to redeem us.
Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. John says in his gospel, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus always was from the beginning. Jesus was always before creation passed in perfect communion and fellowship with his father. And on Good Friday, we remember the separation that was created by our sin. Our sin separates us from a loving God and our sin can't be removed by good deeds, but paying the price of our sin, Jesus died on a cross for you and me. And that death brought apart a real separation between him and the Father and bringing a pain and an agony that none of us can imagine. We know the loss that we feel when we lose the loved one. Many of us have endured the pain of feeling disconnected from our spouses, our loved ones, and our parents. That loss was magnified in ways that we can't even imagine when the perfect union of the Father and the Son were separated on the cross. And Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, Jesus was referring to Psalm 22. And as he re refers to this Psalm, those that would have heard him say this would have gone back to the Psalm and reread it and know what he was talking about, the anguish that he went through and the anguish that you and I feel in relationships, the anguish that you and I feel physically in this world were being paid for by Jesus in that moment on the cross. And Jesus endured a separation from his father that was a separation that was meant for you and for me caused by our sin. So as we extinguish the third candle, we remember that the light that was with God always from the beginning experienced separation from the father for the first time. Would you pray this with me? Jesus, we remember on Good Friday that you endured a separation from the father for us to be redeemed. This is Luke 23 and Matthew 27. By this time, it was about noon and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the son of God. So tonight we have one candle remaining and it's the light of hope. 
John tells us that the light shone in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. The light that was in the beginning with the Father, separated from the Father for the first time, the light that created all things, that was rejected by his own creation, the light that became flesh and blood and bore our infirmities, was now about to be the light of hope for you and for me. But to all those that saw Jesus hanging on the cross, they saw that light get extinguished. And Jesus hanging on a cross, suffocating slowly in front of all the people in front of him, breathed his last breath. And when he did, he said, it is finished. As we put this fourth candle out, let's pray this out loud together now. Jesus, Jesus we, we remember, remember how, how you gave, gave up your life, life for, for us. Say 
as we sit tonight in the weight of what was paid for you and me. The encouragement is that we don't try to carry this for ourselves because the reality is this is something that no one could have carried but Jesus. You see, Jesus paid the price that you and I could not pay so that we could have the life that we could never have on our own. And it's the amazing story that later John says that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever should believe in him would have hope, would have life, eternal life, life that would last forever. This isn't something that we just put on a bumper sticker or hold in a sign in a stadium or shout out as a cliche. This is the hope of the world. And today, as we come to Good Friday, we sit in the gravity of what was paid for you and me, but we do not sit without hope. And my prayer is that tonight and this weekend leading up to Easter is that we would spend time confessing before God. The reality is that, that God, we have all played a part in rejecting you. And because of that, God, you endured a separation from the Father that you've never experienced before. And you endured a pain and a suffering we could never endure. And you died and paid for a punishment that we could never pay for. And it's because of that, together tonight, we want to light the candle one last time. And that's the candle of hope. Because we remember that John told us that the light shone in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. And the hope that we have in Jesus is imperishable. So church, friends, and family, we want to close in prayer tonight and thank God for the immeasurable price that was paid for you and for me. And let us wait with anticipation as we retell and remember the pinnacle of our faith at the resurrection on Easter. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the price that you paid for us. There is no way that we could sit in this long enough or reflect on this long enough that would ever give credit or do worth to what you've done for us. So all we can simply do is receive it and say, Thank you. 
Jesus, as we approach Easter and the resurrection and the reality of the resurrection, we would not jump to resurrection without first reflecting on the cost of the cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for being with us in this church. And as we go, we go in hope. And as we go, we go in anticipation as we get ready to celebrate the reality of the resurrection on Sunday. We'll see you this Sunday, church.